Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to an afternoon with the Heritage Foundation, hosted by the James E. Holzhauser Jr. Speaker Series. I am Tom Beto, a board member of the series, along with John Rauerdink, Kay Wilt, George Little, Larry Cadell, Stephen Later, and Jim Busby. Most of those board members are here, so if you have any questions about the speaker series, they can answer them. Um, John Rauerdink is here under stress. His son, Neil, had uh, open heart surgery on Tuesday for an aortic valve replacement. The operation went fine, but Neil had cardiac arrest on Thursday night. Fortunately, the hospital staff reacted beautifully, and he's, he's fine, and uh, he's recovering now. So keep Neil Rauerdink in your prayers, please. Last March, uh, we brought in Dr. Ben Carson for an awesome weekend, including a health care panel, inspiring remarks from Dr. Ben, and a prayer breakfast with community service organizations the next morning. It was fantastic. In the fall of last year, we partnered with the Country Bookshop to bring you Nikki Haley and her new book, If You Want Something Done. This title plays off the famous quote by Margaret Thatcher, if you want something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> I got applause from about half the audience, I think. We also had two virtual lectures last year on COVID and on property rights, which you can find on our, J on our website, jhspeakerseries.com. The series is a 501c3 nonpartisan organization that strives to inform on the issues of the day. Today's topic is particularly timely. We are proud to honor the legacy of our 68th governor, James Hubert Holzhauser, Jr who was inaugurated just about this time in 1973, 50 years ago. Your contributions and ticket purchases for the series are tax deductible, and me and the other board members would be glad to take your contributions later on if you'd like. Let me recognize some folks who are here with us today. George Little, who is uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees here at Sand Hills Community College, uh, has been for 30 years, George, is that right? 40, oh, so 40 something. Amazing. Larry Cadell, who's the vice chair. Stan and Jean Bradshaw, after whom this building is named. Uh, Stan and Jean, I can't see through the glare, but there they are, over there. I know you have to be really, really proud of how this has turned out. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Some folks have asked me why we scheduled this event on a Sunday. It was simple, because it was the only date available in the first quarter. That means that it's busy, and really busy. So my congratulations to Morgan Sills and his staff. I don't know whether Morgan is in here or not, but he's doing a fantastic job, bringing in talents of all types. He's uh, well, well thought of in New York City, so expect more. He said to me just before, it would be nice if he had bigger crowds for every event. So help out, and when you hear about something that's of interest, sign up and come on out. And congratulations to the best community college in North Carolina. <laughs> Sand Hills continues to evolve to meet the needs of its students, its staff, and the community. They just opened a brand new nursing school, Foundation Hall, with state-of-the-art training facilities to double their output of nurses to help meet the needs of our great healthcare providers here in Moore County. This year also marks the 50th anniversary of the Heritage Foundation, and we are very pleased to have Genevieve Wood, counselor to the president and spokesperson for Heritage, Mike Howell, director of the Oversight Project for Heritage, and John Staub, 
advisor to the president for donor relations. All three have local connections. Genevieve lives in Raleigh, or is now spending a lot of time in Raleigh with her parents. Uh, Mike attended Duke. I'm a car <laughs> So you're supposed to applaud, I guess. I <laughs> I think there's more Carolina people here today. I don't know. Um, and John's father, uh, John Stobbs' father, lives here in Pinehurst. I think he's going to join us if he hasn't already. Uh, my exposure to heritage goes back about 25 years to a time when I was a registered lobbyist in Washington for the 3M company. <laughs> After a long career at 3M, they stuck me in Washington for the last seven years. But it was a wonderful experience, and being in touch with the Heritage Foundation frequently uh, made my job a heck of a lot easier. My wife and I remain very involved with Heritage and always look forward to attending Heritage events across the country. These are smart people, a great solutions-based resource, for the U.S. Congress and state legislatures. Ronald Reagan was their biggest fan during his presidency 40 plus years ago, and much of his mandate for leadership came from heritage scholars and issue experts. The run of show for this afternoon will be as follows. Genevieve will kick us off with a broad overview of heritage. Mike will follow with a deep dive on the southern border crisis. And then we will have a panel discussion to answer your questions and focus on the local impacts of the crisis. There's two microphones in the aisles here, and so get your questions ready. Joining the panel will be Genevieve, Mike, and John, and our sheriff, Ronnie Fields, and his uh, captain, Captain Morgan, who's uh, the focus, who focuses particularly on narcotics. Captain Morgan, you may recognize that name for another reason. After the program ends, we'll have some refreshments and light hors d'oeuvres in the lobby, and you'll have a chance to discuss further with our guests and each other what you have heard. Thank you again for coming. Genevieve, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Thank you all for taking an afternoon uh, to be with Heritage. I do know it's also the one weekend this fall that there's no football going on, so that helps too, right? But thank you all for being here. As you mentioned, this is our 50th anniversary, and how many of you are familiar with Heritage? Just a quick show of hands. Great. So you, okay, so I don't need to go through a lot of stuff here, but I'll make a, a few notes. Uh, during the Reagan administration, especially I was thinking about this, I guess, yesterday uh, when the missile shot down finally the Chinese balloon, uh, that it was heritage where the idea hatched for President Reagan's strategic defense initiative that Senator Ted Kennedy called Star Wars. So it took them a while to get their act together over the past few days in the administration, but I am glad to see our missile systems are in good, good order. Uh, we also have been active in the tax debates over the years with the Reagan tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts, the Trump tax cuts. Uh, instrumental, one of my colleagues was the main author of the welfare reform legislation that Bill Clinton signed uh, in the 90s. And then most recently during the Trump administration, uh, he took on over 60% of the recommendations that the Heritage Foundation had made suggesting he do when he was in office. We were delighted to work with him. But as many of you know, and those who've been involved for 20 plus years, as my, our, my former boss at Heritage and the founder has often said, there are no permanent victories in Washington, only permanent battles. So you win, and then you have to go back at it again. You win, you go back at it again. And so that's what we're doing today. And we have a new president. He's still new. He's only been with us a year, Dr. Kevin Roberts, who came from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And I was mentioning to some folks earlier, uh, they said, well, what do you, what do you, how do you assess him? And I've been at Heritage for 15 years, which I cannot believe it's been that long. Even though we're up against far more now than we were when I started 15 years ago, I have never been more encouraged that we have the right leader for the fight to run today. 
He has really brought the right fights and the right optimism. And what he says about going on offense, he's put the, the full organization into that mode. So we're delighted to have him as our president. And he's really helped us focus on kind of seven priority issues. There's a lot going on in the world, a lot of things we can focus on. But there's seven areas, broadly, that we're really focused on. One we're going to take a deep dive in today, and that's immigration and border security. We're also taking very seriously the threat of communist China. Uh, big tech, any of you who have children or grandchildren know how dangerous this thing can be, both personally but also to our national security and to privacy. We also know the role that big tech pl likely played in the 2020 election cycle. If you ask Kevin, our president, what the number one issue is, he would say education, education, education. That is something we have got to make sure parents have control of what their children are learning, where they go to, go to school. Dollars ought to be following the child, not the child having to go somewhere just because of the zip code that they live in. Education is extremely important. We also realize that's a state battle, like a lot of issues are. And so we're working hand in glove with state after state, state legislators, governors, organizations on the ground, state think tanks like the ones you have here in North Carolina, to get those kind of wins over the finish line. Because most of the best stuff in the world that happens doesn't happen in Washington. It happens outside of, and we firmly recognize that. And then, of course, there's a spending debate. Spending, inflation, and the regulatory state we're certainly taking on. The debt limit battle, of course, is happening right now. The issue of life, protecting unborn life and family formation is extremely important. And then finally, election integrity. All these other issues, it's hard to make them matter if we can't win elections fairly and get the right people in to act on them. So election integrity is huge. And on the speaking of elections, uh, we'll have one, of course, coming up in 2024. And how many of you believe this will be the most important election of our lifetime? It's always the most important election of our lifetime, right? That's what they say every four years. But I think it's because every four years, things are a little bit tougher. Things are a little bit further gone and lost, we oftentimes feel, and we're like, this is the time we've got to turn it around. Uh, I will tell you that we firmly believe at Heritage. This is the most important election of our lifetime. We often say, well, you have to know what time it is in the history of the country. And we're at a very, very critical time in the history of our country. And so, so much of what we're doing, yes, on these seven priority issues, but it's preparing, and not just us, we're leading the effort, but we're working with almost 50 other conservative organizations, both in Washington and outside. I'm sure many, you probably know many of them, Leadership Institute, the Family Research Council, Hillsdale College, you name the group, they're probably working with us on this, on what we're calling the 2025 Transition product, Project. And yes, we've got to get the right person elected in 24, and I know you all will be helpful in that, but whoever that person is, on day one, they have to be ready to act. So we're working on kind of four pillars. One is putting together the policy agenda on issue after issue. You name the issue, there will be policy recommendations for the incoming administration. But you can't just have the right ideas. You also have to write people to implement them. So we're putting together a personnel database where the president, whoever it is, will be able to come in and say, you've already got 10 to 15,000 people who have been vetted and also trained so that on day one, when they go into this department or this agency or that, they will know exactly what they have to do, they will know where the bodies are buried, and they can start implementing the agenda on day one. And then we're also going to have something called the 180-day playbook, so that for the first 180 days, the administration knows, here's the game plan. And not only are these good ideas, these are ideas that, as I said, over 50 different conservative organizations are behind. That's never been done before. But the reason we believe it is so important is because we know what time it is in the country. And one of the issues that we've talked about time and again is the one that we're going to focus on today. Mike is going to talk about our immigration and border security, but he's also going to talk about our oversight project, which is one way that for the next two years, until we can get a new administration in, we can keep a check on what the current administration is doing and making sure that we're making it very hard for them to implement what they want to do. Mike Howell is an attorney. Don't let that turn you off in DC. Uh, but Mike had worked in the Trump administration at the Department of Homeland Security, where he worked with the over 3,000 attorneys in that office dealing with things like congressional oversight. He worked in both the Senate and the House on oversight committees. Uh, some of his bosses were, at that time, Representative Ron DeSantis, uh, Senator Johnson, 
Congressman Jason Chavitz. I'm sure many of you recognize those names. So he is well trained in that area, and we are delighted to have him at Heritage. I will tell you, he hasn't even been on the job one year in this role, and his team has already filed 400 FOIA requests and 15 lawsuits. The Biden administration is not happy that Mike is at work, but we are delighted. Mike, come on up, please. Mike is going to run through our border and immigration efforts, and then we'll be back to take questions. Thank you, Genevieve. Good to be with you all. Um, as Genevieve indicated, I like to talk about border security and immigration, and I think it's so important that we're having this conversation in North Carolina and not in Washington, D.C., because what we're learning, especially over the last couple of years, is that this crisis is by no means limited to the border. This is not a Texas problem, a New Mexico problem, or a California problem. It's hitting every town, every congressional district, all across the country. And so before we kind of get into some of the research we've done here and, and interesting uses of technology, I'd like to spend a couple moment, moments talking about why this matters. We often get this question, who cares if millions of people are coming across the border? What, what's it really matter? Why can't everyone just come here? So I'd like to uh, tick off a, a couple of the top reasons. I think it's a, a major problem, an existential problem, and in my mind, the biggest problem facing this nation. And the reason why it's the biggest problem facing this nation is because it makes every other major problem we have in this country exponentially worse. So let's start off from the national security perspective. Over the past couple of years in the Biden administration, we've had well over 100 known and suspected terrorists cross the border. Those are folks that we just know, that are, are in databases that our intelligence agencies have some sort of information about. That doesn't mean that is the, the whole list of all of the terrorists that have come across, but it means that there are people in this country now that we know have sufficient derogatory information on them, ties to people who want to blow things in the United States up, or you know, in other countries and against our allies are now in the United States and spread throughout. We know illegal immigration is a massive problem too because of the major crime it brings. People, not, people often forget that crossing the border illegally is in and of itself a crime. When the Trump administration tried prosecuting it as such and detaining everybody who did cross the border, this is when the left collectively lost their mind. I'm sure many of you remember uh, the episode that was called, quote unquote, kids in cages. That's something I worked on when I was at DHS quite a while. And what it was actually was the simple application of the law that anybody who crosses the border and if they bring a child with them to do it will be detained in a humanitarian setting until their claims can be adjudicated. And if their claims are viable and granted, then they are let in. If they are not, then they are returned. That is the most common sense application of immigration policy and border policy. It is basically the policy of every first world country throughout uh, the earth. And we simply um, do not do that in this country. We do the exact opposite now, something that is known as catch and release. Uh, many of you may be familiar with 20 years ago when people illegally crossed the border, the, the usual demographic would be a middle-aged man uh, who was running away from Border Patrol in the middle of the night. The way the case is now is you have family units, large groups that do not run away from Border Patrol. They present themselves to Border Patrol because they know immediately upon being presented, all that will happen is they will be logged and released into the interior. That's how open the border is. Border Patrol is not chasing people these days. They're welcoming them in and processing them into the interior. Now that represents a large category of, of the people coming across, but there's also a much bigger large category. This is a category called gotaways. Over the last two years, one million known gotaways, and the, the term is what it sounds like, people the Border Patrol know they did not apprehend, that were either picked up through cameras, sensors, or the like. Now think to yourself, if you can just turn yourself into Border Patrol and be released, why wouldn't you go that route? Well, it's because these people have significant criminal histories, gang ties, terrorist ties, etc., that they know they would be in that small category of people that the Biden administration might even turn away. So now in the last two years, we have a one million illegal crossers that are these known gotaways. That's larger than the population of some states. It is a massive criminal element that we have purposely imported into this country in the past year, and they go all over the United States. So why else does illegal immigration matter? 
if it's just millions and more people coming, what's the big issue? Here's what it hits, education. Our school system simply cannot withstand millions and millions of new students coming in every single year at various you know, levels of education or no formal education whatsoever in our children's classrooms that are now being treated essentially as daycare facilities as opposed to educational facilities. This has caused massive tensions in school budgets. I grew up in Northern Virginia. When I was growing up there, we were dealing with an illegal immigration crisis at the time. We built school after school. It's a highly populated area. Every year, despite as many schools that were built, trailers would have to go up to accommodate new arrivals. Budgets would be strained because you would not have taxpayers paying into the system. Largely illegal aliens don't come in, they come in and they do not contribute on a taxable basis. So you have schools that budgets are absolutely stretched to the minimum, whereas parents who pay into you know, the tax system and property taxes in their district have their children in overflowing trailers in one of the wealthiest counties in the United States with teachers trying to deal with the classroom with people from various different language backgrounds, education levels. It is a massive detriment to an already big problem that exists in our education system, which we could go into with all of its problems with woke education, uh, the lack of teaching, the basic three R's and the like. So it confounds an already terrible problem. Healthcare, we have a healthcare problem in this country. Everyone understands that. We've talked about it for decades. The simple fact is illegal aliens, when they go to the emergency room, which they use as their primary uh, point of you know, a doctor's visit for all concerns, you pay for that. The costs that are transferred from the hospital to the insurance companies, et cetera, end up being passed along to all of us. Everyone here's healthcare premiums have shot up a substantial amount due to the fact that we are providing free healthcare for millions and millions of illegal aliens in this country. Not to mention in the event, if you needed to go to the emergency room, and we saw during COVID many, many emergency rooms were crowded. If you had an emergency and you needed immediate care, you very well could find yourself in a situation in your own country, waiting in line while you're writhing in pain because an illegal alien is in front of you using the same ER and you are paying for it. Now let's talk about some, some more basic issues. What is a nation? I mean, we opened up with Ronald Reagan and I think his quote nails it best. A nation without a border is no nation at all. I think many scholars and people have written on the topic have basically drilled down what a nation is to a couple things. It's a, a people with a common shared history, culture, and language. That's what it is. That's what binds a nation together. It's not that we all pay taxes to the same entity, that we all you know, live under the same laws, although that's not even the case now either. We simply do not have right now that shared culture, language, and history. We're looking at a time in American history where the country is deeply divided as it's probably ever been, perhaps since the Civil War. If you look at the riots that occurred in 2020 where our cities were burned, the fact that we have those policies being continued with absolute chaos in our urban centers, the fact that we have a deep state that's weaponizing the federal government against people of a, a ideological persuasion that they do not agree with, there is simply no commonality that's holding this country together in a way that is actually cohesive. So when you add to that mix millions and millions of newcomers, with no allegiance whatsoever to the United States, who are coming here for purely economic reasons because this is the best economic situation for them, that does not make for a more cohesive nation. And in fact, when these new illegal aliens are in, you know, entered into the US, who are they being greeted by? It's the far left organizations that have helped them come here in the first place. It is the state government on welfare offices that are providing them with massive amounts of financial benefits and a whole ecosystem to, designed to basically accept them into what would traditionally be considered big government and leftist circles and a lot of non-governmental organizations, which I'm gonna get in, into the meat of. If you look at you know, previous iterations of mass migration in American history, they've been handled very, very differently. We had to settle the West. And when we did that, we had a huge immigration wave. It was because America needed mass immigration and of course legal. That was a point in US history where mass immigration made sense. Same goes for the industrialization of the United States. We had you know, large amounts of, of people, especially Catholics and Italians come over and they assimilated into the United States primarily because our school system actually taught patriotic education. 
There was a, a need in our economy at the time for that type of labor. And also we went through massive national events, World War II, a huge event that actually provided for the cohesive basis for people from all around the world to become one and, and fight under the same flag and be an actual nation. So what we're looking at now is this nation is, is being ripped apart at it seems on the things that should bind us together the most. And I don't even need to get into the language point because I think we all understand that while English may be the primarily spoken language in this country, it certainly is not the official language in any government sense. If you look at how our, our government is run, primarily every single document comes out in a, a host of different languages. This provides no incentive for a common language, which would help in the assimilation of, of people into one shared culture, identity, history, language, et cetera. Now, there, there are a lot of other problems I can go into. I'll flag a couple as I see it. And I say all this because I want people to understand why we care about this. The financial problems. The debt in this country is absolutely out of control. The main drivers of that debt are mandatory spending, you know, our social security, our welfare system, et cetera. By adding in millions and millions of people who are net tax takers, not producers, on a, on a huge scale, a huge scale, and this is a talking point you'll, you'll hear from the left a lot is, well, they do pay taxes, they, they pay sales tax. Okay, if you added up all of the taxes that illegal aliens pay through, through sales tax, uh, or when, when even they rarely file some sort of tax return infos, we're talking about a, a degree of you know, thousands in terms of the benefits that go out versus the money that, that goes in. It is simply a massive financial burden on this country at a time where our economic situation is as dire as it has, has ever been. We're gonna talk about the law enforcement angles about this quite a bit with you know, the, the sheriffs that have joined us here today. Um, I think the, the simplest way to, to put this is the criminal element that we are bringing in purposefully to this country is very, very different than the criminal element that we have you know, seen in, in recent American history, even in our, our worst cities. I often like to say that MS-13 and other cartel gangs make the Bloods and the Crips look like the girl and Boy Scouts. The absolute savagery of these cartels is without parallel. This, this happens in the United States all the time. Just last week, we learned that in not too far where, from where I work in DC, 20 miles away actually, an MS-13 member brutally beat and killed an autistic woman. This was someone who was released by the Biden administration even though he had no reason being in this country. Went on to commit the most heinous of a crime against a completely innocent and disabled woman. This would be a national news story if the, the roles were reversed in such a way that CNN or the others would, would care about. But these stories happen on a frequent basis. They're not picked up by the national media. The cartels and the gangs are ruthless. Often, their activity is not just in the United States either. To get to this country, there is only one way to do it. You need to walk up to the southern border and cross several, several different areas to do it. The journey often leads through a place called the Darien Gap in Panama. This is an area where, I kid you not, is replete with you know, things that are in jungles. I'm talking native tribes, I'm talking animals and wildcats and, and, and all the, the dangers that you would never want to have a family going through. This is cartel-owned territory. The only way you get through it is if a cartel member takes you through it. If you were to try on your own without advance payment to the cartels, you would be killed. No questions asked. And that system and geography and, and process works its way all the way up through the southern border. This is land that is not really owned in a sense and operated in a sense by you know, countries like Mexico. It is the cartels that own and operate this. They are in charge. Mexico is basically a narco state run by the cartels now. If the Mexican government wanted to take out the cartels and actually tried, they would not be able to. They work in concert. There is a, a massive amount of corruption and areas of mutual understanding, but make no mistake, the ones running the show there are cartels. And so when we talk about millions and millions of people coming to the United States border, we're talking in practical terms about women and children and, and others being put into the hands of the most vicious of the vicious. Um, 
this is it's Sunday, and this is a, a nice crowd, so I'm hesitating to go through the specifics, but I can follow up on these with, with, with you later. But it is no exaggeration to say that the abuse, both sexual, physical, is replete. It is almost guaranteed. So when you hear talking heads in the media and the Biden administration say that their priority is a safe, orderly, and humane immigration system, what they're really saying is, our border is open, and anyone who wants to get the cartels to take them through it with all of this abuse is welcome to do so. What this also means in practical terms is that the cartels are getting massively rich, massively rich. Their financial resources outpace those of a lot of small armies or you know, even medium-sized armies throughout the world. If we were, say in 2025, to go in and say, this all ends now, we are declaring the cartels a, a terrorist organization and we're going to take them out, it would not be an easy fight. You saw the problems we had trying to take out a balloon over the weekend and then that could have been a problem of political will and also could have been a problem of the actual capabilities of the US. It remains to be seen, but right now you have absolute operational control of the southern border and beneath it with people who through the millions and millions, billions frankly, have spent that money arming themselves to the teeth as paramilitary operations with heavy arms who would use them if we messed with their business model. That is a serious national security threat. We have purposely given up operational control and security of our southern border to people who we may not be able to take it back from. So that's where things stand right now. Um, the numbers have been through the roof, and I, I, I often hesitate to even talk about the numbers because we've been hearing for the past two years, every month or so, the border numbers come out, and people get immune to it. How much can you shock somebody with a huge number month after month after month? But for, for conversation's sake, where we're at now is in the past two years, about five million ticking up to close to six million illegal crossers of the border. Massive, massive, massive number. Towards the end of the Trump administration, that number was close to zero, lowest it's ever possibly been, because we were able to use a lot of executive authority, because Congress is unwilling to act, to turn people away immediately. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Title 42 authority, which basically said, due to the COVID pandemic, no one's coming in. So we proved for a short period of time that with the right laws and policies, you could turn people away from the border. And by turning the, the magnet off, you also disrupt the cartel's activity, the pipeline, and you alleviate a massive amount of human suffering that occurs along the way. So this is a huge problem, a massive problem. And, and, and the final point I'll make before I go into what we're doing about it is the drugs. Opioids are a massive problem. We've had over 100,000 people last year die of opioid overdose. That is more deaths than the Korean War, the Vietnam War, Iraq, Afghanistan, and 9-11 combined in a year. That's a national emergency. It's an epidemic. It is the leading cause of death of people at ages 19 to 45 or something very close to that. The fact that we are treating this with the absolute urgency and all hands on deck national approach that it deserves speaks to a real weakness of will of our leaders and just the inability for them to come to, to grips with the fact that this is a problem that's fueled by the border crisis. They won't solve it. Imagine, compare it to what we did with COVID. Every layer of government, even non-government, weighed in with the strictest possible policies, many of which didn't work, many of which were absolutely harmful. Yet when we talk about something of this scale with the opioid, opioid overdoses, Nothing's being done on the national level, nothing. We're losing generations of Americans. And these are deaths of absolute despair that afflict people from all demographic backgrounds. This, this hits people at all levels of the economic ladder. Everyone in this room, I guarantee, is probably touched in a, whether a degree or two away of somebody who has died from an opioid overdose. The stories are heart-wrenching. They range from people who went into the doctor's office to get and got a pain pill 
which was you know, obviously overprescribed by some of our, our pharmaceutical giants for a time period and then got addicted and then, and then ended up needing to go to you know, actual harder stuff and, and getting addicted to, to fentanyl. They range from people who, college kids, who go to parties in their very first you know, time ever trying drugs thought, you know, hey, it's safe, everyone's doing it, and then they draw the, the short straw. And that, you know, whether it's something even as small as, you know, weed, and I say small, but compared to, you know, cocaine and ecstasy, their first time, dead. This happens everywhere. I've personally lost, you know, dozens of people I've known throughout my life to opioid overdoses. People with kids. People who are doing very well professionally. People who you never would have guessed in a million years would be struggling with such a thing. People who their very first time trying such a thing have died. There's also events where people who are involved in the immediate response to an opioid overdose are killed by the mere exposure to the fentanyl that's involved. This is a massive problem. And the prime driver of it right now is the fact that we have a completely open border. And the sheriffs will talk about this later. The mail is also a huge part too. And, and that, that plays a huge role in border security writ large. But basically what happens is fentanyl is very, very small. It, it doesn't take a lot to kill a ton of people. So when you have a wide open border, which is no longer being patrolled because all the border patrol agents are, are away from their usual patrol spots and instead dealing with processing illegal aliens into the interior, you have just wide open swaths for this stuff to come in. It is not hard to get it in by crossing the border sending it via mail packages. Since it's so small, it doesn't matter if you lose a little bit. It doesn't matter if one of your drug runners gets caught because you have 100 more. And just one of those payloads getting in is enough for a payday of a, of a huge, huge degree. So the border being open is a direct connective tissue to fentanyl getting from initially China, where the precursor chemicals are made, to then the cartels, where they cut it. And they often cut it at levels where they know it'll be deadly. And then up, and then throughout the rest of, of the continental United States. So what do we do about it? What is a group like the Heritage Foundation? We don't have handcuffs. We, don't, we can't make the laws. We're a nonpartisan organization. We can't pick and choose candidates. How do we help people understand this problem? We got an idea. It was after watching COVID, and I'm sure many of you are familiar, there used to be all these maps during COVID that CNN would have, where they'd say, look, look at the spring break down in Florida. You see all these dots, and we tracked all these dots that you know, went from COVID central in Florida and then went all the way out through the country and, and spread throughout the country. We thought, hey, that's an interesting technology. How were they able to do it? And the way they were able to do it is because of people's cell phones. Your cell phone's being tracked every single day. And the data from it is sold multiple times over for ads to be targeted at you, for law enforcement to know where you are, et cetera. This is a huge growing industry where everything you ever click into your cell phone and every place you ever go is known by somebody and sold by somebody and used by somebody. And then we saw after January 6, how were they able to find everybody that was in the vicinity of the Capitol? I'm not even talking about the people who entered the Capitol. I'm talking about people who were at a protest there to voice their concerns about election security who did nothing wrong that day, people who were just in the vicinity. How were those people located? How did they get their doors broken into in the middle of the night and arrested and lives ruined with their faces put up in, the, in their local papers? Same exact technology. DOJ uses this stuff every day for criminal prosecutions, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, et cetera. So understanding that these tools exist, we had the idea to go out and, and use these in the context of the border crisis. And in the specific context we wanted to focus on was the role of non-governmental organizations, NGOs. So the way it basically works is, as I mentioned, the legal aliens turn themselves over to the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol doesn't put them on a flight to North Carolina or South Dakota or, or wherever else. NGOs do. NGOs receive a lot of money from the federal government to do this. That amount of money is absolutely exploding. In the recent omnibus package that was passed by the Senate in December, uh, we're talking upwards of $6 billion split between the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services. This is money that directly goes to these non-governmental organizations. 
Um, these, these organizations rely on a lot of individual contributions. And it's, it's really heartbreaking as, as a Christian to come to terms with this problem, too. Because these are groups that I perceive for most of my life as you know, being completely above board. I'm talking about groups like Catholic Charities, Lutheran Services, Jewish Relief Services, etc. Every denomination that's out there basically has an arm that's involved in border policy. These places have, these organizations have physical locations on the border. This is, these are places I had been. When I go down to the border and, and follow around, you know, whether it's with the, the Border Patrol taking us there or it's us doing our own investigations, these are, you know, actual buildings where illegal aliens are dropped off in. They stay there for about 48 hours while everyone gets cleaned up and, and taken care of. And then they're basically asked, where would you like to go? And once they are told, you know, figure out where they want to go, a plane ticket is provided, a bus ticket, taxi, what have you. And very, very often that end location is a place not chosen by them. It's chosen by the cartel members that got them to the border in the first place. These are people who, once they get to their end locations, are working on, you know, uh, illegal activities. It could be a marijuana farm in the, in the Midwest. It could be part of a gang activity. It could be part of something as horrific as, as human trafficking and, you know, sexual trafficking, which is there's a huge amount of that occurring, where they are essentially sent there and giving money back to the cartels. Often it's because their family members are being hostage back in their home countries, and so they need to be able to provide the money they're able to make in the U.S., to pay off the ransom. So to put it in its most simplest terms, this is a massive human smuggling operation in which the United States, your taxpayer dollars, through the NGOs, and in many instances, maybe even your private charitable dollars, are used as the final link in the human smuggling chain. So after observing this and seeing you know, all the midnight flights that, that were popping up in some conservative outlets over the course of the Biden administration where a plane would land at midnight or one in the morning and then people would get off and, and the, the mayors would have no idea, the governors would have no ideas, we thought we need to get some numbers on this. We need to get some eyes on this. So we, we went out and bought a bunch of the data that I'm, I'm talking or previously spoken about. And we did it for a very, very short period of time, one month. 30-day period, January of last year. And we only looked at 30 locations, NGO locations, that we knew based off of our sources with the side Border Patrol and that I visited personally are confirmed to have participated in this activity. So we did a process called geofencing. That's where you set up an electronic perimeter around the physical location to detect whether a cell phone device is in there. And then over the course of a month, you figure out where that cell phone ended up. Now I'll tell you going into this, what I expected to learn was we would see Miami, New York City, DC suburbs, California, you know, the big hot spots, really reflecting the bulk and the density of this. That's what I, I really suspected to see. That's not what we found, and, and I'll show you right here on these slides. So this gives you an idea of the process. This is the Valverde, Valverde Processing Center, which is in Valverde, Texas, NGO facility I described. Those little dots there are cell phones. Next slide is the, the Customs and Border Patrol station itself. So those dots are the dots that end up going to the Del Rio location. After they are processed and checked in by Border Patrol, they go to the previous slide. Here's where they went throughout the country. And these are only about two, 3,000 devices. I have the exact numbers in the paperwork that was handed out. And so very small sample size of only a few thousand. It was basically a proof of concept for this technology being applied. They're going pretty much all over the United States. There's some direct, you know, or places with higher levels of, of impact. Obviously, since people start out in, in, in Texas mainly, you'll see more activity there. Uh, but still, a lot of, of in the interior of the country, and going up into the, the Northeast. So now that we had proved that this technology worked and we could use it to track, we thought we need to really expand this study. And so we got a bunch more of the physical locations I, I had talked about. So these are the, the NGO facilities that I had previously mentioned, and we captured 22,000 devices, cell phone devices at these locations in January of last year. And then we ran the same test. In a one-month period, where did they go? 
everywhere in the United States. Those blue lines are the path that they take. This touches virtually every single congressional district. This is a massive human settlement program that takes logistical organization, billions of dollars. This is not something that can happen by accident. This is something with a lot of really smart people, with a lot of money and a lot of logistical capacity being able to pull off. Frankly, when we saw this map, and I was working with my colleague, Mark Morgan, who many of you know, who was the head of uh, Donald Trump's Customs and Border Protection, Tom Homan, who was the head of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, other er experts in the, in the area, were shocked. We said, this, this cannot be true. So we did it again. We found a bunch more locations, 5,000 devices, so a, a, you know, one-fourth of the previous sample size. Again, going everywhere, everywhere in the United States. Now, recognizing by the sheer volume of, of money to, and activity for certain locations, we had figured out that the biggest player in this area was Catholic Charities. And so we said, let's look at one Catholic Charities facility to see what this looks like for one location alone in a short period of time. Everywhere again. And that's just one facility. Now, I said earlier, five and a half million people have illegally crossed the border since Biden took office. That's 30,000 devices you saw on those lines right there. Can you imagine what it looks like when that's extrapolated out? We say, as you know, it used to be something I would say a, a talking point that every state's a border state that gets impacted by illegal immigration because of all the externalities I talked about earlier. It's not that. These are cartel activity. They're happening everywhere in everyone's, everyone's district. And with them come all of the problems that I previous outlined. And so uh, we don't stop there. We were shocked by this. And so we took it to people who could do something about it. And I'm pleased to announce that this Congress, now that the majorities have had shifted and the House has folks with gavels and subpoena power, who are interested in, in this topic are zeroed in on it. There will be a series of, of hearings on the NGO participation and facilitating uh, the border crisis. Serious looks are, are being given to turning off the spigot of money that goes to these organizations. Um, there, there is discussion about the application of potential criminal activity to, to these NGOs. The Attorney General of Texas a week after we released this, announced his own criminal investigation into the activity of, of these NGOs, not just at the border, but south of the border as well. So people with power to do something now have the information to go out and do it. And what we're doing day in and day out at Heritage is everything we possibly can to make sure that they do. Because the truth of the matter is, the only thing that ever really stopped the Biden administration from just the full on mass influx of illegals into this country is when they were embarrassed by it. They were embarrassed once, uh, it was early in, in the first year of their administration when 22,000 Haitians had to camp out under a, a bridge in Del Rio, Texas. It's the one time the liberal media turned on them because they realized this isn't humane. It's not humane at all. We have people sitting in bridges in you know, the cold of night in Texas with nowhere to go. And so at that point, the Biden administration realized they have a problem on their hands. We got to get these people moved from the border into the interior of the country as fast as possible. And so that's when you enter these NGOs with massive influx of money to help them do it. It's where you start seeing the construction of facilities that cameras can't get in. Um, something as simple as Fox News buying a drone to fly over the border was able to capture a lot of those images. And that's what made them change their behavior. And now we're seeing the Biden administration change their behavior a little bit more. You might have uh, heard some recent, you know, chest thumping and celebrating out of them that border numbers have gone down and uh, things are under control. That's, that's not true at all. What's happening now is the Biden administration is trying to implement their long-term vision of, of this plan. And that means instead of people coming to the border directly, we're going to fly them in, in here directly from their home country. 
okay? We're talking about massive numbers, the same numbers I'm talking about, will be through a system called parole, which is, you know, different than the context in which, you know, we commonly understand it, where, you know, someone's on parole after criminal charge. Parole in the immigration context means you are allowed in to the country without having to, you know, meet the usual standards. It is something that exists in immigration law for a very discreet basis. It is for your, your greatest humanitarian needs. Think somebody who has a, a heart condition that requires immediate surgery needs to get into the country because, you know, the only surgeon who can do it happens to be in New York. That's a parole case. A parole case is somebody with an urgent humanitarian need. We're talking, you know, it should be dozens at most a year. Extreme circumstances. But no. Now they're looking at, in all these countries from which folks are coming, which, by the way, is, at my last check, 157 countries, so the entire world, we will have flights from those countries coming directly in and working with the NGOs for the onward transit of, of those individuals. So be on the guard for when you hear Biden solve the border crisis because the number of border apprehensions are down. What's, what's actually happening is they're just trying to make illegal immigration not illegal. They're trying to get rid of situations in which there are cameras or maps or videos or drone footage. They want the flights to come directly from some of the, you know, the corners of the earth into places like North Carolina. And this is not something that your governor has the power to do anything about or your state local lawmakers. They aren't even in the loop. They aren't allowed to consent, to deny, <coughs> or even be given any sort of heads up notice. It's just going to happen, and it's going to happen at a massive scale. So the big thing that we're doing to push back against this right now, and this is another uh, piece of paper that you all have, it's a, a first of its kind push on the border and immigration front. I, I love working at the Heritage Foundation, but I realize it's not just gonna be just us to solve this problem. There's a lot of other people who know a lot about this issue, a lot more than I do who have, you know, reaches and constituencies throughout the country. So for the first time in the history of, frankly, the, what I'll call the, the border hawk movement, we got every single organization that's ever played an outside role on this, and then every single Trump administration official that was involved in the last time securing the border on one piece of paper with an absolutely united playbook for what Congress can do on day one to close the loopholes that the Biden administration has been able to weaponize to take advantage of our immigration system. So that's the process we're working now. For those of you who are you know, politically attuned and watching what's happening on Capitol Hill, um, there are some are uh, opposed to that. On both, obviously, uh, this is a political problem and at a 501c3 organization, we, we stray away from, from those politics, but I will say neither political party is fully committed to securing the border as it stands now. Um, the media has played such an outsized role in this where they've convinced many people, even elected officials, that anything touching on border security and protecting our sovereignty is inherently racist. They don't care about the deaths from opioids. They don't care about the MS-13. They care about not being called racist. And so that's the problem we're running into now. I'm confident, though, that with some of the new chairmen in the House of Representatives, we will have actual legislative products that will be put together and passed the House. Obviously, these are things that the, the Biden administration is vehemently opposed to. And so that's where what Genevieve brought up earlier about the, the playbook for the next administration, if we were so lucky to get it in administration, that cares about securing our border will be able to look at this package and say, that's what we're going to do. This is the playbook written by the people who have done it before, who've worked so hard on it. And so that's the fight we're in for the next two years. I you know, pray every day that somebody in the White House will wake up and realize that this carnage isn't worth it. I am not hopeful though. And I'm not hopeful because I know the reality of this, that everything that's happening right now is entirely purposeful, entirely purposeful. There's a strong element of the radical left, which controls at the highest levels of the money sources, that views mass illegal immigration as a good thing. And they view it as a good thing for a myriad of reasons. 
One, they think it incurs a political benefit. They think if you get people who are unassimilated in, into American culture, into the country, dependent on government services, and thankful that you let them in, they're more likely to vote for you. That's a, a sad political calculus. Simultaneously, with the complete deterioration of our election system, you're seeing things in places like Washington, D.C., California, you know, Chicago, et cetera, where they're doing everything they possibly can to make it easy for illegal aliens to vote. It's an immediate political tool for them. That's the long-term game plan here. Five and a half million people coming to this country over two years, that changes the political calculus of this country overnight. It already has in many ways. In the Trump administration, we fought so hard to have the United States Census basically ask one simple question. Are you a citizen of the United States? This was the thing the left probably fought the hardest on, and they won. And Chief Justice Roberts sided with him, believe it or not. A simple question. We were told that you know, the United States government doesn't have the authority, essentially, to ask if you're a US citizen. And there's a couple reasons why they, they fought so hard. One is because from the census, you draw the congressional district maps. They're based off total population. And so now you have congressional districts that basically wouldn't exist but for the sheer amount of illegal aliens or representation numbers would be different. So there are people in Congress right now who are only there for the sole reason of mass illegal immigration. It's a, a terrible situation in which politics has been put above the concerns of the country in so many different ways. And I often like to draw the comparison to all the things that they accused the Trump administration of, which was a new thing every day. So many things that it's impossible to remember. But one of the uh, biggest ones was, let's talk about the impeachment over Ukraine. The chief criticism, which has since been debunked a, a thousand different times, was that President Trump allegedly traded US national security for his own political interest. They said by President Trump asking, tell me about the corruption in Ukraine, he was violating US national security for his own political benefit. Okay, that's what they impeached him for. So now my question is, how can you open the border, full well knowing the consequences thereof, deaths across the country that are solely, solely related to this chaos on the border, enriching the cartels who are arming themselves to the teeth to take operational control of our, our sovereignty on the border, all of this terrible action that hurts all of us, our healthcare, our schools, et cetera, for a direct political benefit. That is the worst thing I think a president of the United States has ever done. And they would like to say it's something that's happening everywhere. Oh, this is just something that happened to us. This relates to COVID and you know, the, the world being crazy. People just wanna to come to America. America's great. And so that's why they're, they're coming here. No, that is not what happened whatsoever. When Genevieve talked about her 2025 plan, I often think back to the plan that the left had for when Biden came into office. Their first actions, all related to immigration and border security. And during the transition period, leading up to the Biden administration taking over, there were multiple briefings, dozens and dozens and dozens, which both career officials who'd been in the Border Patrol and Immigration Enforcement Policy their whole life, told the Biden administration, if you do this, then I guarantee this chaos will ensue. They were told that, they were warned that. We have this in writing. And they did it anyways, full well knowing the harm that it would cause. And, and so for me, we talk a lot about impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas as a first step. That's an active discussion on Capitol Hill right now. I frankly think impeachment is the lowest, common pun or the lowest possible punishment for such an activity. I don't think our legal system, our constitutional system, has ever found itself a situation in which those entrusted with their prime responsibility being the security of this country absolutely throwing it out the window and knowingly doing something harmful. It would be the equivalent of if we entrusted a general in a war to go and fight a battle and he did the exact opposite or she did the exact opposite. You said it. That's kind of the way I, I think the conversation needs to go. 
It's unacceptable. And it's also creating a problem they know is not solvable entirely in the near and short term. While they're doing all of these things, and, and one quick aside, they brought in an individual named Cass Sunstein. Some of you might remember him from the, the Obama administration. He's a Harvard law professor, the brightest mind on the left. I often say is the LeBron James of leftist regulatory lawyers. This is someone who could have been a cabinet secretary, a, an ambassador. His wife is actually Samantha Powers, who's the head of USAID, but a leftist superstar. You haven't read his name in the news. That's because they put him in the Department of Homeland Security in charge every day of ripping away the regulatory framework and trying to make sure they're immune from court challenges so they can conduct all this plan. They got the brightest minds they could possibly find. And then they drew from the hardest core elements of the activist world to implement these policies. I recently had our team pull basically the political appointees resumes responsible for all areas of border security and immigration policy. It is no exagger exaggeration to say, virtually everyone is a hop, skip, or a jump, or at some point in their life drew a paycheck from a George Soros affiliated foundation. These are the individuals that have been seated into the administration with responsibility to protect this country. It is a hostile takeover. And this is not something that's happening just in America. This playbook was run in Europe. It was run in France and Germany. This has been run over and over again, and it'll be continued to be run. The vision, ultimately, in my view, from the hardest core leftist actors, is that nation states and sovereignties aren't a good thing. They're the problem. And if we fundamentally change the composition of countries and flood countries with mass illegal immigration, places like America just won't be America anymore, and they won't be that important. This is the end goal. The end goal is Western civilization ceasing to exist. This is Marxist theory. And if you think I'm exaggerating, you can look back at their own very words on this topic. Ever since massive immigration legislation passed in the 1950s, the hardest core communist elements of this country through their front groups were at the very forefront of all of the policy discussions. Saying the same things I'm accusing them of doing now because that's what they have admitted to doing. This is Marxist theory. If you build a giant underclass in this country and rip apart the institutions, you can implement your agenda much easier. You can break down what we you know, have left and remaining of American institutions. This makes every part of the plan easier. And it's time, we got, it's time to act. And I'm not seeing the urgency around the country to, to deal with it. And you know, if I can encourage you all to do one thing, it would be to call your elected lawmakers or any policymakers and say, why is this not issue number one? This has to be solved immediately because they're doing so many things that every day we wait makes it harder to solve if somebody actually wants to. For example, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the entity in charge of removing people, which has entirely been shut down during this administration, they just frankly aren't removing anyone. The left is taking away all the private prisons and enforcement tools, techniques, and infrastructure that they have. So they're starving basically out an industry that would need to be rely relied upon should we actually do something about this problem. They're humiliating the Border Patrol. Humiliating the Border Patrol. They've turned some of our bravest people who take awfully tough jobs. We're talking about jobs in the blazing heat. The pay is low. You're away from your family. You're out in the desert all day and night. These are tough jobs. What have they done to these individuals? Humiliated them. Do you remember in Del Rio, Texas, over a year ago, when the Border Patrol was accused of whipping Haitian illegal aliens when they were on horseback? It was chaos. Every media outlet, every leftist Twitter account, et cetera, was in a firestorm for 48 hours saying that our Border Patrol agents whipped Haitian illegal aliens all on the basis of one photograph of a, an agent on a horse trying to do some amount of, of order on the border. Obviously, they did not whip anyone. And anyone who knows anything about enforcement, border policy, or even, frankly, horses knew that. And so one last thing I'd like to say about what we're doing, and this segues into the oversight project work, is we sued him over this. 
we saw Joe Biden and Alejandro Mayorkas go to the White House podium and say, this is the worst incident we've ever seen. It conjures up images of the worst times of our, our racist problems in this country. You had people comparing it to all sorts of, of you know, racist moments in the United States history. These Border Patrol agents became nationally criticized. Their faces plastered all over the media. They'll deal with this for the rest of their life. They were put on desk duty, thrown under the bus. So we sued. I basically said, I know they know this was, this was a crock. I want every piece of paper that Alejandro Mayorkas had in front of him before he went to that White House podium. Sure enough, they said, of course not. We're not giving you that information. So we had to take him to court. Took him to court, and what did we get? We got an email to Alejandro Mayorkas immediately before he gave that, that speech, where his very own press secretary, his top person preparing for the speech said, we have a news from the photographer who took that picture. He said there was no whipping. She highlighted it. He saw that, he knew that, and he went to the White House podium and he threw these people under the bus. It's atrocious what they're doing, humiliating them. There's, it's no wonder we see just an uptick in suicides, people quitting, divorce rates through the roof of the brave Border Patrol. They're making it so hard that if we ever wanted to build it up again, it would require a massive national effort and ramp up time. They're destroying the system at every possible level from the personnel to the infrastructure, to the, the legal framework, the regulatory framework. This is a full scale assault on the system. And it's all for that political benefit that they think they get out of it. And I think it's one of the worst things that's ever happened in this country. Uh, with that, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over. That's massively scary. I heard that word a lot, and it's probably totally appropriate in every case. Could I ask uh, Genevieve and John and the sheriff and Captain Morgan to come up, please? Microphones are open and available. Anybody? Has any immediate questions for Mike? I'll try to start it off a little bit, but don't be shy. Trying to bring it down to North Carolina a little bit. Um, I did some brief research, which is probably totally incorrect, but that there are somewhere between 325,000 and 400,000 undocumented persons living in North Carolina, which is 3.5% of our population. No doubt that most of them are good people who just want to work and get ahead. But living below the radar is problematic in many ways, as you've heard from Mike. What happens if they get sick? Or their kids show up unexpectedly at our schools? And what happens when the bad actors among them bring crime and drugs into our towns and neighborhoods? Sheriff Fields, I'm going to ask you the first question, and it's kind of a broad one, but can you describe what you see happening on the law enforcement front here in Moore County? Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, on the law enforcement side, uh, we've seen a huge increase in uh, illegal immigrants coming into uh, our state and into our county. Uh, the increase in drugs uh, is, is, is phenomenal. Uh, I can give you an example. In 2013, we had 28,000 calls for service in Moore County. Just this past year, we had 54,000 calls for service in Moore County. So. Uh, the, the numbers of overdose uh, are, are going out the roof. From 20 to 21, we had 145 overdose deaths that the Moore County Sheriff's Office responded to. During that same period, we had four deaths. Last year, from August of 21 to August of 22, we had 165 overdoses. 
of them, we had 12 deaths. Uh, as Mike alluded to earlier, these drugs and this drugs do not discriminate. It, it gets all walks of life. So, and it's very heart-wrenching for us and our staff to deal with this and to walk in daily and see our young kids and even our older folks and uh, it's got a lot that are productive citizens get involved with the use of drugs and overdose and die. It's, it's very heart-wrenching, so. Thank you, Sheriff. I failed to mention that Senator McGinnis has joined us and uh, he plans to drop a bill this week on fentanyl. Uh, <coughs> Senator, could you come to the mic and sort of explain what the gist of that legislation will be? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the folks from Heritage for being with us today and giving us this great insight. Uh, by being in the General Assembly, we're privileged to some information that the general public doesn't see, and of course, one of them is 1,500 people a week are dying, uh, 100,000 a year, roughly, and since 1999, a million people have died. Uh, so it's a significant number, and as the Sheriff just mentioned, they don't discriminate. They don't care what color you are, what creed you are, what religion you are, how old you are, how wealthy or how poor. Uh, one of the prime examples that I saw here in the last few days was a college student who sprained his ankle. He said, you know, I think I'll go to the ER. And one of his buddies said, no, don't worry about going. Said, I got a couple of Percocets. He gave him one of them and he killed him. He didn't understand that his friend got it from an illegal source who didn't know that it came from the Mexican cartel. Now, I'm going to go ahead and throw the Biden administration under the bus right now because they know the cartel that's making these drugs. They know where they're being made. They know who's the precursor chemicals, where they're coming from in China and India. They know how they're coming across the border, but they're not doing one damn thing about it. Yeah, right. Not one thing about it. Now, I don't understand because I believe if... Uh, President of the United States would call the President of Mexico and say, you know, uh, we know all these things and you can do something about it or we will. We got these uh, drones with these Tomahawk missiles and you're going to blow them up for a little bit and they might change their mind. Now they'd go somewhere else. We all know the rat's going to seek the lowest level. But uh, until you've had a family <laughs> member like my family has lost somebody, you don't, you don't think about it. It doesn't hit home until you, until you see it firsthand. Fifteen years ago, we lost a beautiful son. Uh, to this epidemic, and that was before fentanyl. That was just the opioids. But the fentanyl deal adds a new dimension and a new dynamic because it takes no prisoners. So right now, or but let me go back a year, the high sheriff called me, Sheriff Fields said, you know, that possession of fentanyl is not a felony. And I said, Sheriff, you've got to be wrong. There's no way that that's the right thing. I said, you must have misread that thing. And I doubted my sheriff, and I apologized to him, and I'll do it again. Because I doubted my sheriff, and I shouldn't have. I knew he knew what he was talking about. And I did find out he was correct. And we ran legislation immediately at the request of our sheriff. And let me talk about our sheriff's department. We, I've worked with a lot of sheriffs in North and South Carolina and Virginia. Uh, in, a lot, in a lot of different circumstances. We have no better sheriff's department anywhere in America than we got right here in Moore County. Thanks, thanks, thanks. But we passed that legislation and made it a felony for possession of fentanyl. Now, we started looking here a few weeks ago about the matter of, of trafficking in fentanyl. Well, of course, in 2004, long about that time, the methamphetamine was just gone, that, that epidemic gone crazy. So they did a carve out and did a lot of extra things for that. And of course, heroin has always been high on the list of, uh, of tragic things that happened with that. And so what we're going to do, we found out that, uh, that the fentanyl, uh, in order to get trafficking on it, it started at 14 grams. The well, only problem is four grams will kill everybody in this room. So the toxicity and the potency and the concentration of the death and destruction that comes with a little bit of that stuff is horrific. So what we're doing, we're going to lower that number back from 14 down to four, make it a class C felony, which we've, no matter if you've, you've lived a life at the foot of the cross and you made one error, you will get active prison time. 
but you'll also have a fine that starts at $500,000 and then it goes up to seven fifty, dollars and it ends up at a million dollar fine. We're going to make it so uh, if the, if the and, and let's, let, me, let me really define what I'm saying. The person that has one piece of fentanyl in their pocket, I'm not interested in. They've got an addiction. They've got a problem. We need to tra handle them in another way with, with uh, the ability to help them get off the drug. I'm talking about the guy that was caught recently in, in Piedmont, North Carolina with, with 20 pounds of it. I'm talking about the one that's got a thousand of these pills that look like child's candy. And it's just a matter of time for some children to get a hold of that stuff and we're gonna see a lot of, a lot of problems. But, but we will make that happen this coming week. I hope we're ready for prime time on that. And then also, we have death by distribution in North Carolina. Now, death by distribution means that if I sell you, hear the word sell, if I sell you uh, some drugs that kill you, and it can be proved that I sold them, that these good detectives, which we have one of the best drug detectives in America, right up on the stand there today. If, if, I can, if, if, if we can figure that out, they get death by distribution, which is second degree murder, which is 20 years in, in the penitentiary. So the, the way it is right now, you heard me say it requires a sale. Well, they had it in there of any type of distribution, but the, the liberal left wing just went ballistic. Oh, we can't put these people in prison. We can't put these drug dealers in prison. It's horrible, horrible to do that. So I don't believe that. I think we need to put them in prison and forget about them. But so what we're going to do, we'll be bringing back that death by distribution, and we'll be adding the word fentanyl in there for any type of transfer, no matter what it is. And we'll give our sheriff and his men and the district attorney and the other folks the tools they need to prosecute. I was giving a public speech the other day, and I said, persecute, and I'm going to go ahead and say it again. We're going to persecute them and prosecute them. But, uh, but that's the, the long and the short of that uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, you allowing me to have a moment. I'll be around if anybody's got a specific question, or I'll, at the appropriate time, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I don't know whether you've looked up fentanyl, uh, the definition of it, or where it comes from, but it was a drug that was purposely created for people who are terminal cancer patients and are in terrible pain. It is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. So you can see why just a little bit can go a long way to killing Americans. A question for Mike. Uh, the NGOs uh, that are facilitating illegal entry and assimilation into our country, so to speak, it's not assimilation, it's transportation. You said they're receiving direct funding from our government, up to six billion dollars. I believe you said. How? How? And from what departments? And how is that? Uh, what's the name of it that they're getting those funds from? Right. It's a great question, and frankly, it's one that those with the most expertise in Capitol Hill haven't been able to fully get their hands around. But I'll tell you what we know now. It's that primarily DHS through FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, the entity that's supposed to be responding to hurricanes, disasters, et cetera, gives out grants and reimbursements to these NGOs under the guise of it's some sort of emergency and, and shelter and, and care. But these are um, NGOs that have very sophisticated DC lobbying operations. I know this because when I was a Hill staffer, they'd be in our office all the time. They know how to get money out of the federal government in various different ways, and so it's difficult to track. Another big pocket is HHS, Health and Human Services, which manages the Office of Refugee Resettlement. That is uh, where the programs are housed that primarily relate to children, UACs, unaccompanied children. There is a large pocket to the tune of billions of dollars that go to that, to that. and essentially the fact pattern is if a child crosses the border, they are taken to the custody of HHS ORR, who then places them with the sponsor, quote unquote, but the sponsor could be anybody, because one of the first things the Biden administration did was tear up the vetting procedures that the Trump administration had put into place. 
So very often, the, the way an adult illegal alien will get into the country is to bring a kid with them, recycle a, a child, the child will be sent somewhere in the US, back across the border, go through. And so those are two of the, the really big pockets. But I'll tell you one that we just recently discovered, which is even more problematic, the American Rescue Plan Act. This is the first bill that, that passed this Congress of, of major import. This was the, the COVID bill. The Biden administration's, I think, shy of $2 trillion uh, was passed under the theory that this is money to get our economy back on track, to help businesses that were shut down. Through some of our investigations and lawsuits, we discovered that these pockets of money, which have basically gone to blue state pension bailouts and all sorts of woke programs, a significant pool of that money is used for states who seek reimbursement for paying off the NGOs. So it's complicated. We're, we're on the track to figuring it out, but those are the primary massive buckets. And then honestly, a lot of this too is, is private money, donations. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, what about the northern border? I've read recently that there's not nearly as massive a problem up there, but is there a problem? Yes, absolutely. So the, the benefit to the northern border is the Canadians actually take their border security a lot more seriously up there. You know, the Mounties have a lot more power and uh, control in taking custodies of folks, so you have a willing partner on the other side of the border. That being said, there still are major, major problems. I mean, that is largely unpatrolled territory for large swaths, and there are illegal apprehension numbers that, that are spiking there. Uh, the, the drug issue in the, the Northeast is, is a huge one right now. I mean, Vermont has a huge opioid problem, and that's the way a lot of opioids get there. It's also an issue for, for terrorists. This is another area of, of available entry. And again, when you take all of these Border Patrol agents who are supposed to be all across the border, north and, and south, and instead turn them into daycare providers, Uber drivers, processors to hand off to the NGOs, you leave that space wide open. And so not to a matter of the, it's a difference of degree, but it's, you have the same type of, of problems there. Thank you. Sheriff, the, uh, there was an article in the pilot recently about a gentleman who had kept uh, some folks prisoner in a home here in Pinehurst. Uh, what about human trafficking and um, that area? Is that uh, more of a problem now? Well, anytime you have one one uh, victim, it, it's a problem. And, and of course, we had that here in Pinehurst. Uh, but uh, we d we're not seeing as much, uh, Tom, on the uh, human trafficking side as we are on the, the drug side. Uh, but we're, we're hearing that the cartel is using like Mike talked about the uh, the the cost of of getting a family member acro across, and then when they get them over here and, and on our side, then uh, they're sending their money back. And how are they doing that? They're selling dope, selling their drugs, pushing their dope out here to our kids and our family members, and having them addicted and causing loss of life. And that's some of the issues that that we're seeing. So um, I know in Cumberland County, which is bigger and you're larger. Uh, municipalities and the bigger counties, Wake County, Gre uh, Greensboro, Forsyth, and so forth, they're, they're seeing more up there than we're seeing here in North County. I know you're very active in the State uh, Sheriff's Association. Is there a, a couple of the bigger counties that are having much more problems in this area? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. We, we discuss that, the issues. Uh, we work very closely. Uh, uh, I'm on the legislative committee of the uh, Sheriff's Association, and, and, and it's, it's an honor to have a, a good relationship with our, like Senator McKinnis and legislators to help us uh, uh, change laws and things that can help us uh, to, to combat some of the problems we're having. Uh, immigration law, I think there's a new bill just uh, been passed or, or introduced. Uh, it's on now to, to force all sheriffs uh, to work with the immigration department. In the past, some of our bigger counties, Mecklenburg, uh, Wake County, and some of the other bigger counties, uh, they refused to work with them. 
I will work with them day in and day out and do whatever we have to do to uh, protect our borders, our folks. Thank you. Uh, Genevieve, having met and talked to your relatively new boss, uh, Kevin Roberts, I know there's a fire in his belly. Can you describe how things have changed at Heritage under his leadership? Well, I've worked for four different presidents at Heritage. Let me say they were all wonderful uh, leaders and presidents. But I, as I mentioned when I gave some brief opening remarks, Kevin really came in with a, a sense of urgency that I think I've, I've not seen. And I think part of that is, is he came from outside Washington. And he worked in Texas, one of the, he, well, he ran the largest uh, state policy think tank in the country there. But he's had other roles as well, and he's worked with a lot of state legislators and state governors, and just like I said, been outside D.C. and sees what happens or doesn't happen in Washington and how that's harming the rest of the country. And so he, I think he brought that urgency there. He uh, said from day one, we're on offense. We stay on offense. Uh, our foot is on the pedal to the metal all the time. And so I, I think he's and it helped us really prioritize what are the issues that we have to get right now. There's a lot of things that we could deal with, but I mentioned the seven that we're really focused on. And it's because we believe those are the most important right now to, re to turn around and to gain ground in. And there's nothing more so than, than border security uh, because of how much that impacts so many of the other areas that we're talking about. Could you uh, list those seven again very briefly? Sure. So immigration and border security, uh, spending and inflation, which I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, issue over education and the parental role there, uh, protecting unborn life, uh, election integrity is very key, and then of course the uh, taking on big tech, making sure that that's kept in check, and countering communist China. Did I get all set? Very good. Uh, Mike, what uh, other oversight projects are on your horizon? I know you have uh, been really focused on the border issue, but are there other things that your team is working on? Yep, absolutely. So it will largely maps in the priority areas that Genevieve just, just laid out. So the way we like to think of, of this is we have some of the smartest issuary experts at Heritage writing white papers and engaging in discussions and influencing policymakers. I want to turn them all into investigators because I think that's what this country needs right now and that's obviously what the agenda for at least the House of Representatives will be. And so drawing on the experience of people who worked in the administration of whether Trump or previous ones, who know, you know what type of documents exist in what type of places, we brought, built a basically a litigation team. We have 11 people on our team, uh, four lawyers working on the outside who are in federal court every day, and then people who understand information access laws, both at the state, the federal level, and then people with real serious former federal law enforcement records, decades thereof, at the, the highest levels of the federal government and also the intelligence community. Uh, one area where we're going to be especially active is with regards to the what is called the Church Committee. Um, there is a new select subcommittee in the House of Representatives, which is called the, the Weaponization of the Federal Government uh, Subcommittee. Uh, will be very similar to the activities of the, the church community in the 50s, which looks at the rot in the intelligence communities, the weaponization of our DOJ and FBI, the interference by them in the elections. And we are, we are planning a very aggressive litigation strategy. Um, February 7th, I believe, don't, don't quote me if it doesn't happen exactly on that day, we will roll out a series of lawsuits against the Federal Bureau of Investigations based off of very specific things that we have information to believe exists. So asking for documents, email chains, et cetera, that I think will be very helpful to congressional investigators. We are also suing on some of the more high profile things that I know a lot of people here are upset about. Let's talk about the Biden classified documents for a second. Those documents were quote unquote discovered six days before the midterm election. Six days before the midterm election. The American people did not find out about that until January of this year when a CBS reporter was able to find out. The fact that we were not informed prior to the midterm election means only one thing. They hid it because they didn't want it to influence the election. 
This is what I call election interference by omission. You betcha if the, Trump had anything similar occur, that would have been leaked and out there the very first day. And you compare that to how they treated President Trump when they raided his home. So we're also suing on that, that event in fact pattern. And just to, to further drive the point home, if you go on the National Archives website right now, this is the archives. They're supposed to be the librarian for the, politi you know, the government. This is not supposed to be a politicized entity. You'll see on their website a variety of, of random events, book fairs, and, and things they're excited about in the archive space. And then you'll see a list of all of the press releases they put out about President Trump and classified documents at his residence. If you looked all day and all night, you would not find one mention of what's going on at the Biden administration, classified documents hidden at his properties and his think tanks all throughout this country. That is a prime example of the federal government being weaponized. And it speaks to how deep the rot goes when an entity that should be as neutral as basically the librarian for the government is self-engaged in this activity. And so to answer your question, we're going as many places as we possibly can go in the short period of time we have. We'll probably have and are tracking for 100 lawsuits this year alone, which is going to be a, a mountain of a lift in addition to a lot of other investigative activity using advanced technology like the cell phone data um, that we have. It's my view that America is living through a moment of peak corruption in both the quantifiable and qualifiable sense. So there's no shortage of targets. It's just time is working against us. I'm running out of ammo up here, folks. Come to the, come to the microphone if you have a question. Steve Woodward. Hi, I just wanted to say if I was an illegal immigrant and I saw the gentleman in the beard, I would turn around and run. <laughs> but, um, my question to you, and you, you, uh, you mentioned this briefly earlier, uh, we know that uh, the left hates uh, police officers and sheriff's departments equally, the, the police for arresting criminals and sheriff's departments for encountering illegal immigrants. When you, in Moore County, when you encounter one, knowing that he's already or she has committed a crime just by being here and their next crime will be worse, what are your, what are your options? What can you do with that person when you're looking them in the eye? Well, first of all, there is a procedure. If we arrest one and, and we know he's illegal, then we notify uh, immigration officials. Uh, they, in return, will come and call. And once we're through with him uh, here, as far as uh, prosecuting and going to sentence, then at that time, they'll come down here. But they're not gonna come and let even violent crimes, uh, they'll wait till after they're completed before the immigration officials even show up and do anything. It's a problem. Pauline. Hi. First of all, I wanna thank you so much. What, what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity this is for all of us. Um, last night, I had the honor of listening and sitting next to Gordon Chang. Um, it was the Republic. It was the State Republicans Women's Convention in Raleigh, and he talked a lot about the Darien Gap, which you mentioned. And I would just like for you to tell us a little bit more about it, because from what he stated. The Chinese are building a lot of buildings on the Panama Canal, wanting to take it over. Um, the Chinese are sending the fentanyl there. The Chinese people are coming through the Darien Gap. I, I had never heard of it, so I would like you to educate us a little bit more on that, and thank you. A absolutely. So. A lot of the illegal aliens that are coming to the U.S. are not coming from Mexico. They're coming from south of the border and from countries uh, across the world. And so the often geographic pattern is people from the Middle East, Africa, other, other parts of the world will fly into countries like Brazil and Venezuela, where there's also cartel activity, and they work off their payments to their cartel handlers. Now, to ge geographically get to the U.S.-Mexico border, you basically have to transverse the Darien Gap. It's what we would call a chokehold point. So this is the area where physically they have to go through and the cartels complete control over. 
it is no surprise that the Chinese Communist Party has such an interest in this area and actually in, in making sure that illegal activity continues to flow through it. We don't need to look too far back in history to, to see China seeing the advantage in drugs hurting the United States or, or, or sickness. Just look at COVID. Look at their tactics in the great opioid wars. They see what's happening to this country and how we're robbing our generations. They want to keep that going and alive. And so they're there, and it's not just the Darien Gap. In, in countries across the world, China's engaged in debt diplomacy, essentially, in building out the infrastructure systems, the telecom systems, the rare earth mining, and, and trying to make sure that they are the world power because they have access to all of these things. So they're hurting us on purpose, and they're making sure we can't do anything about it. But the Darien Gap is just such a key point, and I'm glad that people are talking about it more. It also speaks to the ease of if we actually had the political will to do something about this problem, you could do something about it. You're telling me the country that landed on the moon can't shut that place down? Can't get out there? Come on now. Thank you. Robert Thrush. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you all for coming today, and uh, thanks to Sand Hill Community College for uh, putting this on. Uh, Mr. Howell, I, I can uh, pretty much go along with everything you said today. I've been very involved in a lot of these type of things through the years and course of my life. And uh, I come from a family that you may know. Uh, we actually helped the U.S. Border Patrol with our airplanes, uh, Thrush Archangels, that U.S. Border Patrol purchased to help check the, the border and everything for all these illegal operations and all. But um, you were exactly right. There's not enough political willpower here to stop this stuff. I'm really quite honestly getting sick of it. I've sat on the sidelines for a long time, kept my mouth shut about it and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that I see. Uh, I'd like to say also I appreciate our sheriff here and his staff for what they're doing. They do a magnificent job. And I haven't been that uh, well versed on the Heritage Foundation or any of these organizations because I've pretty much been sitting on the sidelines. But uh, I'm in a position now, uh, since I finished in Washington, that uh, I'm gonna start helping a whole lot more monetarily. I want people to start thinking about this stuff really seriously, get up out of their chairs so they can get to their wallets so they can help the people like you all that are trying to get this problem fixed. That's what we need to do. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Stephen Later. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Captain Morgan, Sheriff Fields, can you explain a little bit in terms of what categories of crime you are seeing illegal, illegal immigration and illegal immigrants manifest them, itself and themselves most clearly? Drugs. Drugs is the number one issue. We've got a hub right across the county line, and I can't say a whole lot. It's still a um, pretty hot venue right now that we're working. The captain's doing a, a, a great job. Uh, but drugs is the big issue. Uh, we just back in the fall of 22, uh, we talked about how they're getting um, drugs and narcotics and cash and money into our county. Uh, I've assigned one of my uh, detectives uh, to work with the U.S. Postal Task Force. Uh, so far, it's been a great benefit uh, to hear the Biden administration that they've shut down the transport into the drugs is not true. They're using their own postal service uh, to bring drugs in here to Moore County. So we're working uh, with the task force and other federal agents uh, to help us and assist us in any way we can. So, uh, uh, so far it's uh, paid big dividends. Uh, we've got a couple kilos the other night. Uh, we've got about 43 pounds, I think, uh, in the last few months. And it's all coming out of that one hub. So, uh, and you're talking about pounds talking about just grams, I'm talking about pounds of fentanyl that would kill just about the whole state of North Carolina. So uh, uh, it's a serious problem. And uh, the Biden administration is talking about guns, 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 and all these mass shootings. All they're trying to do is deploy what the real issue is, and that's the drug issues and, and immigration stuff's coming in like that. So, Over to the left. Else is taller than me. 
<laughs> I uh, listened to a podcast of a lady. Her name was Tara Rodas before I came here. Mm -hmm. And she is a whistleblower that tried to come forward. She was worked with the Inspector General's Office of, uh, I guess, Health and Human Services. And she answered the call when they were being overwhelmed by immigrants to go down to the border and help in the processing when they were just having this mass flow. And she, uh, she spoke Spanish, she was fluent in Spanish, and she thought she could help. So she went down and she was absolutely horrified beyond belief at what she was seeing. And you know you have touched on the, the effects of the human trafficking. Uh, those stories are just terrific. But a question that I have from the law enforcement angle, because I am one who is just devastated. I was a law librarian for very, very large law firms for more than 30 years. I worked with a lot of these agencies on a daily basis, and I am just, uh, you can hear it in my voice, just so saddened at how corrupt everything has become. But she gave three examples of recent examples that they have um, uncovered. One was uh, a teacher started noticing children that were in their school who were coming very, very tired, and they were having chemical burns on their bodies. And they found that 50 of them, and these are middle school age children who were fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, working at a slaughterhouse, the graveyard slip at a slaughterhouse every night, and then trying to come to school during the day. They gave another example, I think chicken processing plants are one where they are being farmed out to, to work. And again, it's these, they are paid pennies or their, their children are being, or their families are being held hostage. It's just a tragic situation. So my question is from a law enforcement angle, when we have lost faith in our FBI, when we've lost faith in so many of our agencies that we pay our taxpayer dollars, to enforce this, mm -hmm. what can be done from a law enforcement angle when you hear of these sad, sad cases? You're speaking of housing these folks? I'm speaking of when you can go in, because I unfortunately know that many of our corporations are behind a lot of this because they want the cheap labor. Right. So when so many roadblocks, as we're hearing today, are being put against everything, what can we legal, what can legally be done? Well, it started back in the probably late 70s, early 80s when immigration, uh, when we started seeing an influx uh, here in Moore County, and most of that was tobacco farmers. Uh, we were bringing them in, they were the, bringing them in, but they, they were going through processes back then, and the alcohol commission pretty much put the rules of what they can do, there was inspections at these camps and so forth, who was legal, who was not. Uh, back in the early 80s, when I was a sheriff's office here in 82, we had certain camps here. And if we had warrants or so forth, I could go into a camp, and if they didn't have the green card, we would arrest them, bring them in, call immigration, and they'd come and deport them. That's not happening anymore. You can't get them to deport anybody. There's over half a million uh, of illegal immigrants here in the state of North Carolina. And I think they've got about 13 agents working the whole state of North Carolina. They don't want to do nothing. They don't want to help nobody. That's part of the problem. Okay. It's sad. It is. It is. It's very Can sad. Go ahead. Go ahead. I agree with you completely, and I know the podcast you're referencing. And there is what I think is a solution that fits in line with a lot of the other solutions this country needs. And that means empowering the states to take control of this. We understand that Congress isn't going to do it. The agencies have been captured. So there's a lot of ways we can empower the states to do more. About 10 years ago, Arizona tried doing this in terms of you know, some amount of immigration enforcement. And it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't touch anything immigration enforcement related. Um, it's the federal responsibility only. Well, we got a different Supreme Court now. And President Trump and conservatives worked pretty hard to get it, so I say we give it a spin, and we get a case up there. There are activities in Texas that are underway where Texas is taking more of a role in terms of actually putting up barriers, trying to apprehend folks and, and whatnot, but ultimately, unless you can pick someone up and send them back across the border, it's not going to stop it. And so 
a lot of people are pushing on Texas to declare what's known as an invasion under the Constitution, to, to describe what's happening to them as an invasion, which means they could treat it with all the force necessary to repel such an invasion. And so I think the states need to push really hard on adapting their laws, the, the legal movement needs to support them, et cetera, because it's not gonna come from DC. It's gonna come from the states doing something hardcore on this. Thank you. I believe that's John over there. My question is a political one. It seems so obvious that we need an immigration system that makes sense for America. I think most people think that's just common sense. But yet at the congressional level, it seems as though, regardless of which party has the majority, nothing happens. They pay lip service to it, but nobody, neither party, seems to be able to come up with an immigration system that makes sense for our country. What, why is that? <laughs> I, will, I will do my best in this 501c3 environment. Um, the truth of the matter is, there is a lot of money involved. And in our political system, money is what speaks. The corporations have a lot of power. They want cheap labor. Uh, both the, the low end levels of, you know, in your factories and your manual labor, but also at the high ends in, in tech worker jobs. They'd rather bring in a tech worker from India who will work for half of the price and be indebted to that company than to hire someone at market rate who just, you know, an American who went through college. And so those pressures exist on, on um, lawmakers heavily. The school system, and I mean the, the higher education system, plays very largely. Towards the end of the Trump administration, there were attempts to basically ban Chinese students during the COVID epidemic from coming to US in, university systems. Great idea, makes perfect sense, right? If you're a Chinese student, you have to be cleared by the CCP to go to the university system. No wonder we're losing all this technology. Perfect sense, we need to get a grip on that. Well, guess why it didn't work? Because the first call that a congressman or senator will pick up is from the university system president. It is a cash cow for him. It's, it's foreign students paying full fright, and that's often the CCP paying full fright. There is money involved in reasons why these people don't want it to happen. And there's also the issue, and you're gonna find this out very soon in the coming weeks, to see if the House of Representatives can be strong on this issue is that we do not have two political parties that are actually committed to securing the border. Not even hard stuff of the immigration system, just securing the, the, the border. And that's because there is a lack of spine. People are afraid of the treatment the Trump administration got, the slurs that are hurled their way. And, and to that crowd, I would say this. I know we talked a lot about illegal immigration today and all the, the horrors that, that go along with it. But we need to remember that America is the most generous country in the history of the world. We let over a million people in legally a year. We have a robust refugee system that any of these illegal aliens, if they so choose, could go through the refugee system to be placed here. There are systems in place. We have done way more than any country in the history of the world has ever done. And so to say that if you know some modicum of restriction on the crazy ends of this makes one a, a, a xenophobe bigot, is just nonsensical. We need the backbone to stand up to the radical folks and say, we're not, we're not taking that charge. Stan. A question for Genevieve. Um, I'm very glad to see one of your priorities is election integrity. Maybe I'm an idealist, but I believe that most Americans would be appalled or are appalled by all the things that are being discussed today. Mm -hmm. Yet there's people being elected that are facilitating and maybe actually executing these kind of policies, which tells me that our election system lacks integrity. Yeah. Please give me hope. <laughs> and in 2024, we'll have more integrity. You have to have hope. I, but I think there's good reason for it. Uh, we all saw what happened in 2020 and even in 2016 and beyond. I mean, the Heritage Foundation has been, you know, election integrity has become a main big news story in the past four years or so. But it's something we've been tracking for, I think, 10 to 12 years. And if you want to go back, we have a database that looks at election issues across the country, local level, state level, federal level. Elections have been stolen and rigged for a very long time. 
and by both parties, by the way. It's not just, not just a one-party problem. So you can go back and look at all of those. But what we're seeing most recently is obviously at a much higher, higher level. And it's an issue that is going to, and thankfully, thankfully, we were able to stop what the Biden administration and the Democratic Congress under Nancy Pelosi and then also up with the Senate were trying to put through, which they wanted to federalize our elections, right? So that basically the federal government would decide what the rules are in every state around the country. And we know what that would mean. They'd all look like Arizona, right? Or what state, they'd probably put Stacey Abrams in charge of that new agency. So that was stopped, and that was one of the most successful stops we've made under the Biden administration. And now that we have a Republican uh, House, we're not going to see that come back up, which is wonderful. But the real work is going to have to be done at the state level. And what I would encourage you to do, we have on, our, on, our, on the Heritage website an election integrity index. So you can see state by state, and we've got a color code as you, you know, green is doing really well, yellow has some work to do, red have a lot of caution. And you can see what is it that, what would make a state, and this is a, for every state, what would make each state's system stronger and more proof from, uh, bulletproof from having its election stolen or rigged or maneuvered, right? And you can see what is our state doing right and what do they need to do differently? And I will tell you, we've had great success working with state lawmakers and state legislatures to start implementing those kind of things. And Georgia is a great example, because in 2020, there was a lot of questions in Georgia, right? There were a lot of questions. Whether everything would have turned out completely different had the laws been different is, is up for discussion. But they have made real changes in their laws so that the last election they had, they had more people voting than the election before. They had more minorities voting in the election than they did the time before. And people were confident in what actually happened. And that's because their state lawmakers made changes that needed to be made to make sure those elections were secure. Now, let, let's be clear, every state's got work to do still. And as we go into 2024, some of those laws are gonna continue to be changed and we, we'll be more secure as we go into that election cycle. But we have to think about what the left is doing in some places we may not like and we may not think is right, but until we change our laws, we have to fight them at every single level where they're pulling this stuff. If they're going out and they're trying to get people to the polls, we have to go out and get people to the polls. I'm not saying doing anything illegal, but some of the things that people are doing in California and other states, it's currently, we may not think it's ethical, but it's legal to do. And we've got to fight them at every single angle if we want to make sure that we win in 2024. But I think you should have hope because states are making changes and they've got to continue to keep doing it. But check out the election integrity scorecard and it'll tell you, North Carolina's doing pretty well, uh, but there's still some places where the state senator may want to take a look at that to continue to make them even safer. I think we're actually in the mid 20s. Uh, I looked at it recently. Recently? And the voter ID issue is the number one problem. We voted for it, and a bunch of judges uh, threw it out. So, anyway, Senator, hear that? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, who's uh, Kevin? I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, loosely connected to the border, but more of a question to the Heritage Foundation because you're the leaders of think tanks in America, uh, free market capitalism, which I'm a huge fan of and, and is being used as a weapon against the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really confused on how to handle it because I'm such a believer and it's the great equalizer and what makes us great. And uh, I'm really scared to screw with it. But the, the bottom line for me is I don't understand how a country we can't buy land in can buy as much land as they want here. I, I, my brain can't handle that. Uh, uh, you know, I think in Mexico, I think you're, I know people are retired there, they could lease it, they don't own it. But they could buy as much as they want here as non-residents. Mm -hmm. so I, I don't, there's something about that that, you know, I think smarter people than me have to deal with, and I think you guys are the people that take on this challenge. I, I'm not saying your priorities right now are correct, but I'm really worried that people can purchase their way to take over America or another country. And, 
And, uh, you know, I think we all thought capitalism would bring us all together, and I, I still do. I think, think free market capitalism, has, you have to be careful if you touch it. And, uh, but I, I'd hope that's on your agenda for the future, and I'd love any comments you have on that. I can comment to that, and then Mike or John, if you all want to make others. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the federal government's number one job is to protect its citizens. It's not to do all the other things that it currently does. It's to protect its citizens. And one of those protections is making sure that foreign interests aren't coming in and doing exactly what you're talking about. But once again, that's also a state issue. And states, several states, where you see the Chinese, and it's, it's not just happening in one or two states, it's all over the country. They're coming in and buying up land and trying to buy up, you know, maybe apartment buildings or just vacant land that you would think, why would anybody even want that? But they're buying it up. And some of it's in key places where maybe we're doing missile testing, where they can actually see what we're doing on a defense level. So states, though, can come in, and some have, and I don't remember the two off the top of my head. I want to say Alabama may be one, but there are others that are coming and saying, we're, not, we're passing legislation that does not allow land such as that to be sold to a foreign government uh, and to foreign entities, foreign corporations and companies. I don't know that it goes down to a single individual, but a corporation or a government entity is not allowed to buy that land. And I think that's a great thing that we need to make sure that we're doing, because you're exactly right. That is not... Um, that's not good. That's not good stuff. And, but, it's, but it's something that every single state has to be following. It's not just a federal issue. Over to the left. My name is Patricia Rowe, and I have been a resident of Moore County, but uh, currently I'm in Rutherford County. Uh, I've been active in the uh, Moore County GOP here and in the Rutherford GOP. And I have to commend all of you on the stage today. I am very impressed with what, you, in particular, I, what you're doing is just absolutely amazing. But what I really want to do is I want to turn to the audience. And um, I've been very active in an organization called the Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership. I've been at very active in a group called the Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership. And so many people asked, particularly after the election where Trump lost, what can I do? What, you know, what can I do as an individual? Well, we all have a voice. All of you have a voice. And there are organizations that teach you how to expand on that voice. So if you're interested in knowing at least one organization that I know of that uh, can help you do that, please see me. But each and every one of us, not just these people on stage, but each and every one of us needs to become active. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Karen Cook and I'm a conservative resident of Moore County. And my question, closer to the mic, is this better? Okay. My question is for either uh, Genevieve or Mike that um, the gentleman before me with a question on capitalism was heading toward where I'm going, which is um, the transformation of the uh, society that our forefathers brought to the one that we're seeing today uh, that's leading away from that. And uh, Mike, in your comments when you're talking about uh, the specific issue of the borders, and I think every one of the um, efforts that the foundation is working toward are certainly excellent things to be working on, border security is certainly one. You mentioned very briefly that the end result is uh, turning our society over into uh, Marxism. And it's always like a very last remark, even if it's made in any specific issue. And that was my question when I first started reading about all these issues. Why? Why is this happening? What do they want? Until I realized what Soros and his buddies really want is the dissolution of society as we know it. And it's usually just sort of like an afterthought, if at all. And I'm wondering what the foundation is trying to do to bring this to uh, people's attention, that it's all, all linked to one end goal. And I don't think there's a lot of people here today that are much younger than I am, but they're the ones who are going to be voting in the future, and we don't see them, and they don't seem to care. And is there any way to reach out to these people to help them realize what's at stake here? Thank you. Can we go to the 
So you're absolutely right. I, you know, I, we want to let people to leave here motivated and encouraged, not down and out. Uh, but what I'm going to say first may, may push you towards the, uh, the latter, which is everything Mike talked about that's happening with border security and the different agencies, that's what's happening in education policy. That's what the Department of Education all, is all about. Uh, it's happening in our health care. That's what HHS. It's happening in our military. Everything's about training uh, the wokeism into our into our uh, service members. So it's ha it is a concerted effort. It is not just about the immigration issue. That's a big part of it. But it's it's a full on plan taking over the universities, taking over churches wherever they possibly can. I mean, everywhere you look, they're trying to take over the institutions. And you've all heard that was their idea was let's do the so march through all the institutions. Well, they've, they've almost finished marching. And the reality is, here's the encouraging part, is that we know what's going on. And as bad as the outside forces are, China, big tech, a lot of others, they won't get it unless they get the core of the country. And if the core of the country is willing to fight back, we can win this thing. And I'm so encouraged by several of you who, without even asking you to say, what can we do, have said what you can do. Um, I mean, this, yes, it takes money. As I always say to folks, you know, saving the country, it's like we say, nothing we all know as conservatives is free. And that includes saving the country. <laughs> it's not free either. But it's going to take our time, our resources, our financials to make it happen in the commitment. But you're, you know, we know what the problem is. And I will tell you, Heritage produced a number of materials aimed at anybody in this room who wants to learn more about critical race theory, how it comes from the whole Marxist tradition, and how they're using it in all these different areas. But we've also produced products that are for, say, college age and high school students on the dangers of socialism and where this heads to help debunk what they're being taught, obviously, in the schools. Uh, for those of you who have college age children or grandchildren, we have a young leaders program, an internship program, where we really indoctrinate them uh, in, in the right theories about government. <laughs> So, and there's a lot of other organizations in D.C. that are doing good work on that as well. The Leadership Institute, Hillsdale, you know many of them. So, I would, so there is research out there, but if you go to heritage.org and type in Marxism, you will find a whole uh, grouping of great materials in the kind of form that you can give to your neighbors, not just written for other think tank members or members of Congress, but written in the language that your average American citizen can say, this scares the daylights out of me. I don't want this for my country. I don't want this for my children. And you'll reach more people than we ever will if you take it and give it to others. So thank you for that, for that question. Joanne. Um, uh, Mike, my, uh, you mentioned the non-governmental organizations. Um, am I being naughty, naive in thinking that it's, in their minds, a humanitarian effort? Or is there more behind that? Um, and what are you doing? to stop them from providing these relocation places at the border, or what can we do to stop them? Right. Um, so I think a lot of this is a good segue from what Genevieve was just saying in terms of the march through the institutions. A lot of these organizations have DC arms and charitable arms that have been more prime targets for this type of activity. I do not think for a minute that your average church-going donor who gives money to these organizations is, is fully understanding and in on the plan on this. And I do think there is an appeal to the humanitarian services. And there is a humanitarian way to do it. And I think some people, for probably the vast majority, are in it for that reason. That being said, the folks who are making the decisions and cashing the checks and asking for the checks are very involved in keeping this business model because when we're talking about billions of dollars, that's what it is, a business model, alive. A good example of this is in some recent legislative flare-ups that had to do with the border. You have these same charitable organizations in their lobbying arms fighting to keep the border wide open. So if your ultimate interest was in alleviating human suffering and your activity was solely for the purpose of helping that humanitarian suffering, why in the world would you vote for policies that create more suffering? And so that's the position we find ourselves in with a, a lot of the leadership of these organizations. And, and, and for the matter, I don't believe nine out of 10 leftists are in on the plan that you know I've so described that the higher levels who are pushing these things are in. I think everyone here wants to help people in need. 
And I think there are better ways that we could do it than having a wide open border with the cartel controlling it. It's just the, the like all industries and business models, once you get that much money, that much ideology, that much power intertwined, it's really, really hard to, to change. And, and so it was a shock when the Heritage Foundation, especially led by Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is a devout Catholic, was willing to call out an arm of, of you know, Catholic charities in this regard. And it's a tough conversation. I don't enjoy it particularly, but it needs to be had. And, and so that, that's where we are now. Okay, one last question. I see somebody over there. Sarah Jane, is that you? Go ahead. My name is Sarah Jane Harmon. I live in Southern Pines. Um, thank you all. Uh, this has been wonderfully informative. And thank you for the work you're doing, Heritage Foundation. I think you're on the right track regarding state level legislation and so on. Uh, what about the more local level? What might the mechanisms be to give more power to municipalities, county boards? Now, Trump uh, made an effort in this regard. He put through an executive order giving county boards the prerogative to refuse refugees coming into the county. We tried to bring this to the attention of our local county board and nothing came of it. And then that executive order was, uh, was canceled by Biden. It was one of the first ones he canceled when he got into office. But what are the mechanisms to give more power to local governments, county boards, um, maybe school districts, uh, to refuse illegals, to keep them out. That's not politically correct, I know, uh, but uh, what, are, what are mechanisms? The Heritage Foundation are masters of lobbying. What are the mechanisms to give that, that kind of power to local, locally elected boards, government boards, such as county boards and municipal town councils, also school boards and so on to uh, keep illegals, non-citizens out and especially so-called refugees because that's become an extremely corrupted avenue mm -hmm. for this sort of thing. But um, what, are, what, are the, what are the mechanisms, the political mechanisms, the governmental mechanisms to give more power to uh, county governmental boards uh, and um, uh, the boards of agencies such as school boards. Who wants to, to take that one? Who wants to take that out? one? <laughs> sure, why not? And I got a good answer for this one, but it's just not with me. I have a, a paper <laughs> written by my colleagues that has 20, I believe, solutions, and we're touring the country giving these to state and, and local officials. These are concrete. A lot of them have legislative text, but I'll go over a couple high-level ones that, that come to mind. On the NGO front, Many of these groups are licensed through the state in, in some capacity. Uh, when you're talking about care for children and, and adults, there's licensing requirements that, that go into play. And if there are not, you should put them in, and then you should make sure that those organizations don't fit those licensing requirements. Um, you should look at the grants that go out from the states, because a lot of these organizations play in different areas too. So you should make sure to audit all of the state money going out to make sure that no one involved in the scheme is getting money directly or indirectly. There's uh, something very simple that I believe only Texas does right now, and that is publishes crime data based off of uh, citizenship status. Maybe other states do it, but no one does it to the level that Texas does it. And the reason why they started doing this is because the, the narrative out of the left is always illegal aliens commit less crime than U.S. citizens. That's totally bunk. And so Texas started providing the data, which then is very helpful as a, a basis in both legislative activity at the federal level, but also the judicial level. And then um, getting over the hump that states cannot do anything immigration related, I think is the absolute key to this. That's going to take some activity to get it to the Supreme Court. And usually what that means, at least you know the way the left does it, is someone has to try something. And that means trying something that's out of the box and uncomfortable. And there are a lot of tools in the toolbox. We can talk about uh, public education, disclosures there. We could talk about uh, things that have to do with the hospitals and, and providing care. 
Um, all these other touch points that illegal aliens have with the state and local government uh, need to be front and center in all these discussions. But we'll, we'll send out this list. I think it's a great starting point because it's the recognition that it, it's got to be the states. And I keep an eye on Texas. Florida has some interesting ideas. Uh, but someone's basically just going to have to break the mold, get something to the Supreme Court. The way I look at it is we as conservatives often like to limit ourselves and police ourselves and say, I'm not sure if that'll work or what's the vote of the Supreme Court going to be on this. Whereas the left, they just do things, outrageous things. And then they end up getting you know, this into practice. Look at Obamacare. You know, survived despite a, a, a clear reason for it to be taken down. Look at the deferred action for childhood arrivals, the totally made up dreamer category that the Obama administration made up. Wholly unconstitutional. But we still have it today, despite numerous, numerous court challenges and reliance interests that build over time. They're just so much better at lawfare and so shameless with these things. So we got to take matters into our own hands and, and get really creative. And we got a new Supreme Court now, and I think we should try our luck with it. Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, you look at things like, you know, sanctuary cities. Yeah. Those aren't constitutional, but they just pop up and nobody does anything about it. I mean, look at during the 2020, the riots in Portland and Seattle set up their own little city districts of madness and federal courthouses were under siege and nobody did anything about it. Uh, so we're not encouraging, let's be clear, lawlessness and people yeah, yeah. trying that. But we are, <laughs> I'm going to be carried off by the sheriff. Uh, but we do want to encourage, Mike's absolutely right, you have to get in there and you have to do things. And you, and you have to be willing, this is at the state, the, the state level, but you're right, the local school board level and, and, and beyond. But another tool that I would like to, to mention, uh, John rightly brought this up, is our uh, sister organization, Heritage Action. Uh, because actually, Heritage itself cannot lobby. We're not a lobbyist organization. But Heritage Action, our C4 organization, can. And they are very active here in the state of North Carolina. They're active around the country. But their, one of their chief goals is they've got operations set up in the states so that they're not in Washington telling people out here what to do. They have off, we have offices out across the country working with local activists on the ground, finding opportunities to make a difference like what you're suggesting, and then helping that person work with the state legislator or state courts, who, wherever it needs to go, state agencies, to make a difference there. So I would encourage you to check out Heritage Action, heritageaction.com, and you can see what's happening in North Carolina, but they're always looking for folks to bring attention to what you just said and coming up with ideas and strategizing with you, okay, how do we make a difference here? So I would really encourage you to check out Heritage Action. The very capable lady that runs Heritage Action has also got North Carolina ties, yes. so it's a strong connection here to North Carolina. Um, John, I'm going to ask one more question, and that is how would, can you advise our guests here to engage with Heritage and or Heritage Action? Uh, first of all, Tom, thank you for having us here, uh, for organizing this, thank everybody you. for organizing this. Thank you to Sand Hills Community College as well. It's been a real privilege to be down here this afternoon and to spend it with you. Uh, for Heritage, uh, heritage.org, um, uh, another element of, of our enterprise is the Daily Signal, which is our media outlet. Go to thedailysignal.com. Uh, there you can find reporting on, on a lot of the stories that are really underreported by the mainstream media. And then finally, for Heritage Action, go to heritageaction.com. And then, of course, afterwards, Genevieve, Mike, and I will be out in the lobby. And, and feel free to, to ask us questions when we're out there. Thank you, John. Um, we are recording this session. So those of you who have enjoyed it, uh, tell your friends that they can see it in its entirety on JH speakerseries.com. So uh, please do that. Finally, we have a little gift for our guests. Uh, there's a wonderful veteran-owned company here in, I'm falling apart, <laughs> here in Pinehurst that makes what they call heritage flags. Oh, wow. Absolutely. And this is out of uh, whiskey barrels, I believe. They also make them out of pine trees that were felled by hurricanes. And it's a beautiful little company. We like to recognize our, our guests and our speakers uh, with these. Uh, it says on the front, the James E. Holzhauser Jr. Speaker Series. And on the back, it says, our special thanks to the heritage team of John Staub, Genevieve Wood, and Mike Howell for an informative and insightful afternoon with the Heritage Foundation, February 5th, 2023, Pinehurst, North Carolina.